Legend of Total War here, and today we're going to be doing a tier list using Tier Maker. It's been a while since we've done one of these, and we're going to be covering a topic that we've done before, but it was for Warhammer 2, and that is the Law of Magic tier list. There are a bunch of new laws of magic, and some of the older laws of magic will probably have changed places. So, this is the kind of video that can go on for a really long time because there's so much to talk about. So, I'm going to try to be as quick as I can going through each Law of Magic, or else this video will end up being like an hour and a half long, and I don't want that. Now, before we get into the actual tier list itself, I do want to let you guys know that this video here is sponsored by Instant Gaming. So, I use this website all the time. Anytime I hear about a game that I want to get, I always check Instant Gaming first to see if I can get a good deal. I recently purchased two copies of Valheim, one for myself and one for my wife, because uh, she's interested in these kind of games, and we've been playing it in our spare time quite a bit. And uh, you can get some really good deals. So this one here I got for 20% off, but there is, I've seen up to like 95% off. So just having a look here at uh, my playtime on, on Steam, I've got 110 hours just in the last two weeks. And you can see here that it is cheaper than Steam because there's no current Steam sale going on for here. But at the end of the day, it's really important for you guys to purchase where you feel comfortable at. And if you're looking for a bargain, you know, look around. If sometimes Steam will have a great deal, sometimes Instant Gaming will have a great deal. Just, uh, just want to give you guys the best options that are available to you. But I've never had any issues whatsoever with Instant Gaming stock. Um, you know, it gives us plenty of information that it's a Steam key, it's in stock, digital downloads, so it's a key. You know, all the information is here. It's just a really great website. Never had any issues with it. All right, onto the actual tier list here. Um, starting with the lore of Yang. Uh, I think this is a B tier law of magic. So it's really important that we understand context in regard to law of magic. Um, not everything is going to enter S tier, right? That would be silly. Um, I would say that B tier is where things should be in terms of balance. So consider B for balanced. That just means that um, I think the Law of Magic is exactly where it should be. It's neither overpowered nor underpowered. It's got some good spells, it's got some mess spells, and it's just an okay Law of Magic. If it ends up in A or S tier, that actually means that I think it's quite strong. Stronger than other Laws of Magic, obviously. And C or D tier means that, context-wise, you probably shouldn't pick this Law of Magic. Um, now, something might enter C or D tier, and it might actually be a good Law of Magic, but it might just simply have... Um, that race that can recruit that Law of Magic might simply have better options. So context is really important, so I'll keep keep that in mind as I'm talking about it. Um, something that might actually be a decent Law of Magic on its own right might enter C or D tier, but it's because they've simply got better choices. All right, so, and uh, in terms of uh, Cathay, I'm also going to put the other one under, uh, sorry, Law of Yin as B tier. So I think that they're both about the same level of power, but they... They, uh, they're just different. So I've also got Warhammer 3 open here, so we can get the spell browser up and just, just briefly look at the uh, Lore of Yin and Lore of Yang. So I feel like Lore of Yang is good for damage dealing. It's got a buff spell here, but I don't really like uh, buff spells that only affect one unit. I feel like you don't get bang for buck for that, even though it is quite cheap. I guess it's good if you expect this unit to take a hit over the, the 11 seconds. Um, but I feel like Constellation of the Dragon, while it is an expensive spell, really, really hits quite hard. And you've got some relatively cheap, cost-efficient damage-dealing spells that are good against early game armies. Um, overall, it's, it's got what you need to deal with a lot of infantry. Lore of Yin, however, this is more um, uh, effects, I suppose. So you've got Storm of Shadows for reduced speed. Cloak of Jet, I don't think is very good. Missile Mirror is pretty good. You know, if there's some artillery shooting at you, overcasting this will give you some extra range. Blossom Wind... A uh, bit iffy, you probably want to overcast this one to get a bit of extra damage, but it is no Wind of Death, that's for sure. I actually think that's a terrible spell, so I usually ignore it. Talent of Knights, okay. A little bit on the expensive side, but it's okay. Ancestral Warriors, decent summon spell. You know, decent laws of magic there. So that's why I put them under B tier. Okay, so next up we have the Kislev Laws of Magic. I think what we'll do is for racial laws of magic, uh, we'll cover like all of the racial laws of magic all in one go. So... So, so, for example here, only Cathay can get uh, Yin and Yang, and only Kislev can get Ice and Temper, so we'll just cover them all as, like, one section. Now, as for this, we've got to keep in mind that these are the Kislevites' only two laws of magic, right? They don't have other options, they can't get Law of Life or anything like that. So, 
If you're going to get a wizard, you have to choose one of these. Now, I personally think that both of these laws of magic are terrible, but because of the context of it, I really can't justify putting either of them in D tier because you should recruit them, if that makes sense. Um, but if if um, Kislev did have other laws of magics available to them, I probably would um, put these as D tier because both of them are absolutely terrible. Um, I'm going to put both of them at C tier. Um, it doesn't really make sense for me to put them in B tier. They're just not as good as Yin and Yang at all. Um, I would have put Ice Magic as D tier. Honestly, I think it's one of the worst laws of magic in the game. However, I think that in the context of Kislev, um, they can actually uh, make some use of it. But yeah, just going into these two laws of magic just briefly. Okay, Lore of Ice. I think the biggest problem I find with Ice is everything is kind of low impact or high price. Ice Sheet only reduces speed by 25%. There are other spells out here that do so much better. It's, you know, relatively cheap though, so that's great. A Heart of Winter, for example, very, very high damage dealing, but it takes a really long time to cast. So unless you've got the enemy pinned down, I wouldn't even bother with this. Typically speaking, you should overcast it. Death Frost as a damage dealer, just ex really expensive Laura's Magic. Um, Ice Maiden Kiss is okay, and the other two I just couldn't care less about. So Laura of Ice, I'm just not a big fan of, um, but you can get some effect out of it. Basically, every single Laura of Magic can get a lot of damage out of it in the right situation. I think with Laura of Ice, the problem here is that the situations are few and far between, and the impact of it is, typically speaking, quite low. Law of Tempest, on the other hand, is not so much about inflicting status effects, but better damage dealing. So Hailstorm's alright, Biting Wind's pretty good, Blizzard's alright, Hawks of Miska's pretty decent. It doesn't do much damage, but it's good if you're in a blob, because um, it doesn't do any friendly fire damage, and it's it's not overly expensive. So I feel like this one here is quite a reliable Lore of Magic, but it is definitely not strong. So I need to switch it over to units, or else when I'm tabbed out, it'll um, it'll keep playing the, the sound. It'll get super annoying. Okay, next up, we've got the Lore of Slanesh. Now, the Slanesh factions, so that's being uh, Warriors of Chaos and Slanesh, do have access to other laws of magic, right? So this one here could be put into context compared to other laws available to them. So in terms of Slanesh faction, they've got access to Shadow Magic, which is vastly better than, than um, Slanesh. I'm going to put Slanesh as D tier. This is a law of magic to be avoided. It is crap. There is no faction that can only recruit uh, law of Slanesh magic, so there is no reason to ever get it. Just going over it briefly. Okay. Um, the Lash of Slanesh is okay. It's probably the better spell in here. Acquiescence is an okay debuff. It only affects one unit. Um, you know, only affects one unit. This one here is a direct damage spell, which it's just low impact. It doesn't do that much damage for the, the amount of Winds of Magic, of course. It's not very good. Slicing Shards takes forever to cast. The AI is very prone to dodging it, so you got to keep them pinned down. And Phasmacoria is, I guess, okay um, for a leadership debuff, but it's very expensive. This is mainly used, I suppose, in conjunction with their army abilities, because that's how you, you get it up. You pop this down to keep them, um, to route them, and to keep them pinned so you can actually run them down. But typically speaking, um, the Law of Slanesh is one of the worst laws of magic in the game. It is utter trash. It needs a serious buff, just complete and utter garbage. Okay, next up we've got the Law of Nurgle. So, in the context of Nurgle-related factions, so that being Warriors of Chaos or Nurgle, they have access to Lore of Nurgle and the Lore of Death. Now, the Lore of Nurgle is an A-tier Lore of Magic. It is really quite good. Uh, preferred uh, Lore of Magic to get. Um, very, very special for Warriors of Chaos. So, going over some of their stuff briefly. Lore of Nurgle. I guess the big one with that is the heal spell, the fleshy abundance. Overcasting this provides a area of effect. It's very expensive, but it has no uh, entity limit, so you can heal your entire army, like 50% of its health with one cast. All of these spells, in one way or another, are quite good, except for maybe Rancid Visitation, just an expensive direct damage spell. Um, but, you know, 
all their other spells are decent. Actually, Curse of the Lepers, probably not that big of an impact. But Miasma of Pestilence, Overcasting, this provides it with Air of Effect. Stream of Corruption is 100% armor piercing. Really cheap damage dealing spell. Blight Boil is an expo explosion. Typically speaking, it works really well with um, uh, Nurgle because you're a bog down and then cast sort of faction. So oftentimes you're in a bit of a slog and then you use Blight Boil to just explode all over them. So in the context of Nurgle, it complements their factions really, really nicely. And that's why it's an A tier Lore of Magic. All right, Lore of Zinch. Um, you'd think that the preeminent Lore of Magic, you know, the, the, the God of Magic Lore would be S tier, but it's not. It's A tier. It's a good Lore of Magic, but we have to understand in terms of context. Any faction that can recruit Lore of Zinch also has access to Lore of Fire and Lore of Metal, and those are also decent laws of magic. Um, and if we have a look at the Lore of Zinch, A lot of these spells can be either finicky to use or quite expensive. So Pinkfire of Zinch is good in the early stage, no armor piercing. Bluefire of Zinch is probably one of the best magic missile spells in the game, but uh, you, you just end up casting it so many times. Uh, Treason of Zinch is not that big of a deal. Glean Magic is garbage, absolute garbage. Although the AI does this weird thing where they actually cast it on themselves to generate more winds of magic. They kind of cheat with that kind of stuff. So Lore of Zinch is actually better for the AI than it is for the player in some ways. Infernal Gateway is extremely powerful, but it's also really expensive. Zinch's Firestorm is a good but really unreliable spell. So they've got some really good laws of magic here, but uh, sorry, good spells here. But the thing about Zinch is that a lot of it is sort of random in nature, especially Zinch's Firestorm, and can be extremely unreliable, which stops it from entering S tier. But it is a it is a powerful law of magic for sure. But com compared to the laws of magic that will enter S tier, I just don't think it it hits those uh, those notes quite as much to to enter S tier. Uh, then we've got Law of the Great Moor. So in the context of this one here. The faction that recruits this is only the Ogres, and they have access to Beast Magic, Fire Magic, and I think they've got access to another one, but I can't remember. Um, so, they've got choices, but the heroes that get this, the, the Slaughter Masters, um, there's definitely heroes that you should be getting, uh, but this actual Lore of Magic itself, you could simply equip a different, like, two wizards in your army, because they have... Uh, multiple different types of wizards, right? This Lore of Magic, I don't think is very good. It's definitely not D tier. I'm going to put it as C tier. All right, so looking at that just briefly. Lore of the Great Moor. Okay, I think that their spells... They like to put in these, like, anti-leadership spells here that do minus 16. The Brain Gobbler is okay. Like, four wins of magic for a minus 16 leadership is, is decent, for sure. Uh, but as you get later on in the campaign, it's not that big of a deal because... Everything will just have so much leadership. Um, all of these spells are just low impact. Only affects one unit. That's just not that big of a deal. That's the big thing, I think, with a lot of their buffs. Is that they, they don't do, like, area of effect heals or um, buffs. Uh, if we look at the troll guts, this can be a big heal, right? But it lasts a long time, but it's really expensive. And it uh, doesn't overcast, like, the... Um, Law of Nurgle spell to get area of effect. It would be amazing if you could do that. The Moor is an okay explosion spell, but it's so expensive. Same thing with Bone Crusher. I think that's the big thing with the Law of the Great Moor. These are very expensive spells, except for Brain Gobbler. Um, and so you can end up completely depleting your Law of Magic, um, but you, sorry, your Winds of Magic quite early. And I just think that they have access to better spells, which is why we're um, giving them the C tier there. Okay, next up. So those are actually the Warhammer 3 Laws of Magic. All covered there. None of them entered S tier. Uh, but uh, we'll see how the other ones go. Now we've got the Deliverance of Itza Law of Magic. I don't think I covered this one last time because only, um, only Croak can get it. But I thought I'd just do it this time. Uh, this, you'd think, would enter S tier. And you could put it there. But I've... I think it is kind of a new Lore of Magic. I'm like on the border between S and A tier, right? So I'm going to put it at A tier because I just think that there are better Laws of Magic. And also because um, only Croak can get it. 
So you're going to, if you're going to get croak, so you're always going to use it. The context of it is just it's just a bit of a weird lore of magic. I just don't think it belongs in S tier, just because only one character can use it within a faction. But if we go through just the spells really quickly, they're only explosion spells, and it really comes down to how much magic you can generate. Uh, croak can drop down the the winds of magic cost on these spells by a fair bit. Um, it's only good against infantry. It has no value at all against um, single entities or monsters. And infantry deleting spells are a dime a dozen. There are so many good infantry de deleting spells. So the fact that it only does that is just not that valuable. And the thing is, again, context-wise as well, is that the Lizardmen have access to really good laws of magic. They've got access to Law of Life. They've got access to Law of Heavens, uh, Law of Fire... Uh, you know, they've got Skink Oracles with a variety of different magic. So even if you've got um, Croak attached into your army, you don't necessarily have to choose um, the Deliverance of Itza spells in order to be choosing the best spells for that particular situation. So that's why I'm just putting it as A tier. Good lore of magic for sure, but I think some people have like a bit of an over-romantic view of it just because it's Croak and because of, you know, big explosion. But yeah, anti-infantry spells are a dime a dozen, so it's just not that big of a deal that it can uh, explode them. Okay, then we've got lore of the Little War and the Big War. So these are exclusive to the Greenskins, so we've got to keep that in mind. They also have access to the lore of Death. Now, the lore of Death is... All, all of these here are exclusive to the hero type, I suppose. So you can get the Lore of Death and these ones without feeling too bad, because that's one's attached to the um, the, riv uh, the giant river troll hag. Now, the capacity for wizards is t tied to the same um, uh, unit pool for heroes, but in terms of lords, only the lords can recruit the, the little one. Now, typically speaking, I go like this. The lords are a must recruit, the, great, uh, the goblin great shaman, but the hero for um, for the little war, you should go for the big war instead. So, lord, hero, hero, basically. But I would say that the little war is a solid B tier lore of magic. The big war, also a B tier lore of magic. Unless you consider um, rating it based on Wurzag. If you do that, then obviously it's A tier, but I'm not going to rate the Lore of Magic based on one caster, unless it's the only caster that can do it. So, Wurzag is an amazing Foot of Gork caster, right? Um, but all the other ones, it's it's a little bit more expensive. So, just going into the uh, the spell browser and have a look at them. So, a little while over here. The thing about uh, Little War is it's got some really good buffs and debuffs. The main one that I usually go for is Itchy Nuisance. It's a relatively cheap spell that is a really significant debuff to melee attack and weapon strength. So I really like Itchy Nuisance. Uh, and since you're playing as Greenskins, you're usually in melee. So that is very handy. And then the other one I like is Curse of the Bad Moon, which you can cast very cheaply with Great Goblin Shamans on the uh, Ragnarok mount. Um, it's got some really crappy spells in here as well, like Night Shroud. I really hate that spell. Gork will fix it. I don't think it's particularly high value. Sneaky Stabbing only affects one unit. And this is this is a pretty decent um, uh, direct damage spell. But overall, I feel like it's exactly where it should be. Big War. Gaze of Morg with a pretty much exact same sort of effect as, uh, as um, a Vindictive Glare. And you've got some good damage dealing. So with Little War, you've got good buff and debuff spells. And with Big War, you're looking at damage dealing. Uh, that being said, you've also got this pretty significant um, uh, buff spell here. 40 melee attack. It's uh, relatively cheap and it's effect range, so you don't have to overcast it. Uh, Foot of Gork, very expensive, but very good explosion spell. Uh, Fist of Gork, good for imbuing magical attacks, but only affects at one unit. Brain Bursters, I like a cheaper explosion spell. Ed Butt's okay as well. So overall, I think that the lore of uh, Little War and Big War are yeah, okay, exactly where they should be. Then we've got lore of Nehekara. So, this lore of magic can only be recruited by Tomb Kings. So we have to d understand the context that they can also recruit the lore of Light, the lore of Death, they can also recruit Shadows, but it's a little bit more difficult for them to recruit Shadows because they have to get one of the Books of Nagash first. So, I think that the um, the lore of Nehekara is... It used to be really good because you used to be able to use an exploit where it gave you unlimited ammunition, right? But that doesn't work anymore. So, I would say that the lore of Nehekara... 
I probably would have put it as D tier in Warhammer 2, but in Warhammer 3, I kind of feel as though it's it's C tier, borderline D tier. It's not a good lore of magic at all, but just going over it kind of briefly. Uh, kind of a weak spell, only affects one unit. Weak spell, only affects one unit. Weak spell, only affects one unit. It's a direct damage spell. It's, it's okay against cavalry, but it's kind of expensive as well. This spell here is the definition of unreliable. It also has no armor piercing. Not a very good spell. And this one here is usually the one I go for. It's just a, it's a pretty decent debuff. It's a little bit on the expensive side, but it lasts a good amount of time and debuffs the enemy by quite a bit. So I quite like this one. This is the only spell here that's stopping it from entering D tier. This is the one that I like to get. But yeah, this is a mediocre lore of magic to the extreme, and it almost entered D tier. Okay, then we've got Lore of the Deeps. So, context of this one is that only the Vampire Coast can recruit it, but they also have access to Lore of Vampires and the Lore of Death. So, I feel as though the Lore of Deeps is an A tier lore of magic, only because that the faction that can recruit it also has access to vampire magic. If they didn't have access to vampire magic, I'd probably put it as S tier. Basically, it means that they just have options, but this is an excellent lore of magic. Um, and I'll explain why, since we get into here. Lore of the Deep. It really comes down to Van Guy's Revenge. This spell here, non-overcasted, is as good as Wind of Death overcasted, right? A little bit on the expensive side. But the thing is, this is really the only great spell in uh, this particular Lord of Magic. But it is a really good spell. Very much anti-infantry. Kraken's Pool does a decent amount of damage, but it is expensive. Denizens of the Deep is okay for holding the enemy back. Uh, Spiteful Shot is meh, only affects one unit. Tide Call is decent sort of breath attack. Um, Fog of the Damned is okay debuff, but it really comes down to this one here being like the main pull for it. There's also the um, Kiss of the Deep as well, just, just something notable. Um, in Warhammer 2, you used to be able to spam that, um, or sort of cheese that that uh, passive to kill off an entire army if you were patient enough. You can't really do that in Warhammer 3, but uh, just note that uh, the passive is interesting because it dishes out damage every time you cast a spell. Now, we've got the Lore of Vampires. This is always considered one of the best laws of magic in the game, and in Warhammer 3, that's no different. It is an S-tier Lore of Magic, Lore of Vampires. And uh, that's the, the reason why this one here didn't enter S tier. So the factions that can uh, recruit this is the Vampire Counts and the um, and the Vampire Coast. They're the only ones that get it. But to those factions, you should pretty much always get a Lore of Vampire Wizards. They're just so good for their faction. So going over all the spells, pretty much every single spell in this Lore of Magic is amazing. Van Hell's Dance Macabre, Overcasted, a really good melee attack booster, because if, if you're in a blob, just really good. Invocation of Nehek, healing, uh, reviving units from the dead, amazing spell. Raise the dead, you know, flying over and casting really cheap zombies on, on artillery, you get plenty of uses of it, it's so cheap. Overcast it for skeletons if you want. Amazing spell. Gaze of Nagash, probably one of the worst spells in this, or the lesser good spells, I suppose, in this Lord of Magic. It's an eh sort of magic missile spell. I only, I just, I've rarely ever used this, but it is, it is okay. Curse of Years, really good debuff spell. Um, don't need to overcast it. Increases cooldown um, and provides a really good uh, melee attack debuff. And then, of course, Wind of Death. You want to be overcasting this spell. See how it does the same amount of damage as Van Geist Revenge, but it does cost a bit more. But the thing is, the vampires, a lot of them can reduce the winds of magic cost on this quite significantly, so it ends up going down to like 16. Some of them even more so. But the vampire accounts have access to a lot of winds of magic, so the fact that it costs more doesn't really hurt them that much because their ability to just generate more winds of magic than the vampire coast. So, um, consider it about the sort of same tier as... Um, as uh, Van Geist Revenge, but all of these spells are absolutely amazing, ex with the exception of Gaze of Nagash, which is like, just okay. But um, any lore of magic where all of the spells are useful is probably going to enter S tier. And that's why uh, the Vampire Magic did. Okay, so next up, we got Skaven Laws of Magic. So we've got three of them here. 
we have to understand the context of these laws of magic. Only the Skaven can get them. Now, um, they have lords that can recruit, so Gracias for Plague and Ruin. They've also got heroes, right? So Warlock Engineers can get um, Law of Ruin. But the Plague Priest, right? The Plague Priest capacity is also used up in the capacity for um, Eshin Sorcerers. They use the same capacity. Now, uh, you should always get Warlock Engineers, even if you don't necessarily want um, the Law of Ruin in the magic, uh, because they're not mutually exclusive hero types. But these two here, they, they are. You know, um, Law of Plague is just better than Law of Eshin. So, well, Law of Stealth, I suppose. Uh, I think I should get the browse up to explain this. Um, so, Skaven Spells of Stealth. Let's start with, start with this. This is probably one of the worst laws of magic in the game, because as, as Skaven, you get access to Plague earlier than it, in my opinion, and, um, like I said, uses up the same capacity, and it's just not a good law of magic, right? So, providing Stalk for a short amount of time there, I don't find that very useful. Uh, Warp Stars, that's probably the better spells. That's fairly cheap uh, magic missile spell in the game. Uh, one of the cheapest ones. It's decent. Armor of Darkness, I think this is garbage. Uh, Veil of Shadows is eh. Does no damage. It's basically just a way to block the enemy. It's okay. Brutal Bones is eh. It's a debuff for just one unit. And Black Whirlwind, this is probably one of the better spells in this. It is a decent damage dealer, but it's kind of expensive. It's just, it's just not great. And the thing is, when you're comparing it in terms of um, Plague, right? It is just massively outclassed by the spells of plague, because just about all of these spells are good. So, law of uh, the spell plague is so much better of a damage dealer than black whirlwind. So much better. It's cheaper. It does more damage. Um, be casted on walls. It's just such a good spell. Uh, Pestilent birth, getting those um, uh, plague monks summoned. Uh, Vermintide, getting the the. Um, Clan Rat Summon. This is a really good summoning spell. Pestilent Breath. Really good breath attack. Doesn't do any armor piercing though, but still really good. Blessed with Filth. Really good in conjunction with Rattling Guns because it um, stacks with their um, suppressed fire, so it really slows enemy units down. And Wither is probably not that great. And another thing with the, the Skaven Spell of Plague, right, is that their uh, Law Passive uh, will slow enemies down even further. So not only is this great for damage dealing, great for blocking, great for slowing, um, but you've also got the passive active on all of these spells um, as you're casting. So this is one of the best laws of magic in the game. So Law of Plague is going to enter S tier because it is absolutely fantastic for the Skaven. It covers just about every single situation amazingly well. And because it is... Um, used up the same capacity as, as Law of Stealth, I don't ever see any need to ever recruit an Eshin Sorcerer. Ever. In addition to that as well, like, the the Plague Priests are better fighters in melee than the um, the Eshin Sorcerers because they get a Plague Furnace mount which acts as a Mortis engine, and these guys here don't get a mount whatsoever. They get they get a Fireball spell. That's, that's it. Who cares? So that actually enters D tier. Now, it probably wouldn't have entered D tier if it wasn't basically competing with the law of plague. That's the big thing here, that context is important. The reason it enters D tier is because you should just never recruit these laws of magic, right? But if law of plague was weaker, or wasn't mutually exclusive with this one, I'd probably put it as C tier, but I just never recruit this law of magic. I'm always disappointed with it. As for the law of ruin, it's a really good law of magic. Yeah, okay, get back over here. Got some really important spells. Howling Warp Gale is really good for dealing with uh, spellcasters, warp lightning, damage dealing. Death Brand Disease is good if you're going with like melee based armies. Scorches, damage dealing. I don't really like Cleansing Ruin. It got nerfed a fair bit and it's damaged. It's like direct damage. It's whatever. Crack's Call is also uh, fairly damaging as well. But you know, overall, a decent Lore of Magic. Nowhere near as powerful as uh, Lore of uh, Plague, but it's, it's not in competition with it uh, because it's a different hero type that has different. Uh, uses so they they do complement each other so I'm actually going to put that under A tier and that's really what it comes down to these two here don't really compete with each other except with the Gracias but when it comes to the heroes these two here uh, compete with each other that's why that's in this D tier then we've got the uh, runic magic so this one's only available to um, the dwarfs 
and they don't use Winds of Magic. And this is a bit of a weird one where this Law of Magic, if you can even call it that, gets better the more runesmiths you have because you just sort of keep spamming the spells. Going over them, just briefly. Right. Here are the ones that I think are good. Rune of Negation is okay, um, but it doesn't do every effect. It may have used to do, do it on there, but it only affects one uh, unit at a time. Um, so good if you're trying to keep a unit alive. I don't think Rune of Oath of Steel is particularly good. I just don't think that providing extra armor on, on a faction that, typically speaking, has over 100 armor on most of its units is that big of a deal. Especially considering 30 armor is not that much, right? So... Typically speaking, if you're going up against dwarfs, you're bringing armor piercing, and so you're just bypassing the spell anyway. Rune of Wrath of Ruin. Uh, this spell here is better than it used to be in Warhammer 2. Um, it used to be kind of weak in Warhammer 2. It's stronger in Warhammer 3. This explosion does a lot more damage. So this is actually pretty damn good. Rune of Slowness. This is something that the AI usually makes pretty good use of when I'm trying to, like, derp them around. But it's a good spell if you're trying to stop someone from kiting you. Debuffs them quite a bit, and it lasts a pretty damn long while. Uh, Rune of Breaking, I don't really care that much for this, only affects one unit. Rune of Speed, this one here, I really like it. 45% extra speed for the Dwarves, allows you to charge in a lot quicker. But also, that melee attack, it's... I would say it's cheap to use, it doesn't use Winds of Magic, but uh, it's got pretty good cooldown. But it's just a really reliable early game spell for the... Uh, for the... Um, for the Dwarves there. So, I'm going to put the Runic Magic at B tier. Because I think it's exactly where it should be. And you should get runesmiths. It's neither overpowered nor underpowered. And then it's not competing with anything. So it's exactly... It's a pretty easy one to rate. It just goes right in the middle where it should be. Um, okay, then we've got... Okay, then we've got like the eight main laws of magic. And then the elven like master laws of magic. So starting with shadows. Ulgu. Um, very common law of magic. Most of the races in the game have access to this. Uh, going over some of their spells, Law of Shadows. It's a, I reckon Law of Shadows is better in Warhammer three than it was in two. Melkoth, Mystify, Miasma, good against cavalry, I think. Uh, Enfeebling Foe, good debuff, relatively cheap for making enemies weaker. This one's good for routing them. Over, you want to overcast that one. This one here, good wind attack. No, not as good as Wind of Death, but it's you know decent. Um, Occam Mind Racer, magical attacks are more useful now in Warhammer. Three, and Pit of Shades. This is the one to go for. Overcasting Pit of Shades, that's where you're going to get all your value. It's actually cheaper than Penumbral Pendulum, and I reckon the damage dealing on this is just anti-infantry to the extreme. Really good lore of magic. So, I would say in most cases, not all cases, um, I would be recruiting a Shadow Wizard, especially for um, Slanesh. That's the sort of the main one that you really want to recruit. Same thing with a lore of um, so for the Nehekarans for our Tomb Kings. So there's definitely some factions out there where you'll prioritize lore of shadows, but not every single faction. So for example, the Empire or the High Elves, I typically speaking don't um, pick shadows because there are other magics that complement them. So I think it's stronger than it needs to be, but it's not the strongest lore of magic in the game. Oh, Beast Magic, uh, sorry, Wild Magic. That's not one of the the main eight. Damn. Oh, whatever. Um, all right, well, let's do that one next. So the Lore of the Wild, this one here is uh, mutually exclusive with the Beastmen. So the Beastmen have access to Wild Magic, Beast Magic, Shadow Magic, and Death Magic. And while I showcased that stuff in early access with the Lore of the Wild being overpowered with um, Devolve, they have definitely nerfed that stuff quite a bit. Um, going over their spells... Lore of the Wild. Devolve is okay. It does say it does damage to combatants, but that is a complete and utter lie. Um, it is just a debuff. It's cheap. It's okay. Brace Stream is okay. Does a bit of damage. Nothing spectacular. Nothing spectacular. Traderkin is okay for damage dealing. It's probably one of the cheaper damage dealing spells in the game, but it's eh. Uh, Mantle of Gorok. It's eh. Savage Dominion to summon a, a Saigor is okay. The problem with it is that the Saigors just don't last very long and it's kind of expensive. So... In the context of the Beastmen, I think that they just have access to better laws of magic. And so I'm going to put it as B tier. It's it's like not overpowered, neither underpowered. It's just okay. I I do get it for Beastmen every now and again. Uh, it does complement some of your armies. But I definitely think they've got better laws of magics. Now, talking about uh, Beast Magic here. Now, this is one that I have have been 
very critical of in the past, but I think in Warhammer 3, Beast Magic is actually kind of okay. And I'm actually going to put it at A tier. Okay, so let's go in to the spell browser here and explain why I think that it's uh, A tier now. So, um, Wisthand's Wild Form I don't think is a particularly good spell. It all comes down to Flock of Doom. It's a really cheap, very high damage dealing spell. Uh, this is where it gets its power from, I think. Flock of Doom is one of the best damage dealing area effect spells in the game. Amber Spear is okay. If you can manage to line things up, it's very powerful, but that can be tricky to do. Pan's Impenetrable Pelt, um, overcasting that is a really good buff. Um, Curse of Andra here, non-overcasted, is a really good debuff. It's kind of cheap. And Transformation of Caddon is, you know, is okay summon spell to get um, either a Manticore or an Eagle. But um, it really comes down to Flock of Doom providing all the real value. Um, getting a blob going and chucking this down can win you the battle. This can get so many kills with Flock of Doom. And the spell passive helps you to generate Winds of Magic a bit faster. So, um, borderline between B and A, but I'm going to put it at A because I just think that it's actually better in Warhammer 3 than it used to be in 2. Then Lore of Metal, another Lore of Magic that I think in Warhammer 2 that I was very critical of, but in Warhammer 3 is actually pretty damn decent. I'm going to put this in A tier. Um, so, looking over those spells. Or is it Lore of Metal? Plague of Rust I wouldn't bother with. Searing Doom. This is the main one here. This one does a really good job in Warhammer 3. Like, it seems to have been seriously buffed. This is the main one you want to be using. Glittering Robe is meh. Um, Gehenna's Golden Hounds is also a meh vortex spell. Transmutation of Lead. Um, I really like this spell because it's it's uh, got a good effect range. It's not that expensive. And it's a good um, debuff. It's very similar to Itchy Nuisance um, for the lore of... of um, little war but this is really good if you're going up against a lot of melee units and you just want to debuff them it's quite cheap final transmutation is okay against single entities but it's a spell that i'm fairly critical of uh, because of how expensive it is uh, typically speaking d uh, direct damage spells tend to be relatively low value but overall i think it's a pretty decent lore of magic which is why i put it as a tier okay lore of life d tier no i'm just kidding s tier of course, Law of Life is going to get S tier. This is probably the best Law of Magic. Any faction that has access to Law of Life, and there are lots of them, should pretty much always gravitate towards getting Law of Life. Empire, get the Law of Life. Uh, Bretonia, get the Law of Life. High Elves, get the Law of Life. Lizardmen, get the Law of Life. Okay? It is such a good spell. Uh, Law of Spells. So, going over them. Awakening of the Woods. All right. Good amount of speed debuff, relatively cheap explosion spell, good early game. Earthblood, probably one of the best healing spells in the game that isn't, like, for the undead. Really, really good uh, cheap spell. Only affects four units maximum, but you get a lot of healing and a lot of bang for your buck for six or four wins of magic if you put multiple points in. Like I said, in terms of context of the campaign. Shield of Thorns is not very useful. Same thing with Flesh to Stone. A lot of physical resistance there, for sure, but it only affects one unit. But these are just not the spells I go for. Regrowth, really powerful uh, healing spell. But the, where the Lore of Life really gets its power from is Dwellers Below. This direct damage spell cast on infantry blobs is so ridiculously powerful because it does direct damage to the unit and also is a vortex spell. It's like two different types of damage at the same time while also slowing them down. So even if the unit tries to dodge it and is only in there for a couple of seconds, you're still going to get your value out of this. That being said, if you can manage to pin them down and pop this down on a unit, even if it's dwarfs, it absolutely destroys them. Every single infantry unit in the game gets destroyed by the dwellers below. Even if it's got like 30 to 50% spell resistance, it's so powerful. So that's why it's getting its S tier. It's great for healing and it's great for damage dealing. It's got all your bases covered there. And that's why, yeah, it entered uh, S tier. So then we've got the Lore of Light. This is another really good Lore of Magic. I don't think it belongs in S tier. I'm going to be putting it under A tier. Uh, this is really good for archer-based armies, so High Elves and the Empire can really make use of this if, the, if you're using archer-based armies. So basically, if you're using single-entity-based armies, um, then Law of Life really gets you covered. Uh, but if you're using archers, then this one here is really good um, because of the uh, the Net of Amatok. So just going over that really quick. Law of Light. 
Uh, Net of Amatok, really good, overcasted to pin things down in effect range. But if you only got one, like, dinosaur coming at you or whatever, then you don't need to overcast it. It's also got some other good spells, some good buffs in here. So, Barona's Time Warp doesn't need to be overcasted. Good amount of effect range and melee attack. You know, if you've got a hero-based army, that's good. Um, overcasting fast protection is good for effect range. Really getting effect range is what you want in all of your buffs and debuffs. Single entity, single unit, um, uh, buffs and debuffs are just not that useful in this game. Uh, Banishment is also a reasonable, um, uh, Vortex spell. Not the best, not the worst. And, uh, Shem's Burning Gaze is alright. One of the problems with it, though, is that it causes fire damage, and most of the units that you want to use this on will probably have some form of fire resistance. So that's actually a weakness to it, but it's relatively cheap. And then Light of Battle. This one here I don't really like too much, because it only lasts 22 seconds, and you've got to cast it on a unit right before it actually breaks. If a unit breaks and you cast this on it, it'll actually remain uh, broken until it's finished, um doing its cast so this can be a really finicky spell and requires precision timing see if you cast this on a unit and it wasn't going to route then you've wasted the winds of magic so the only way to get value out of this spell is to cast it on a unit that is guaranteed about to break so it's 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 hard to get a lot of value out of that one good on paper but practically speaking it's very finicky i really feel like its duration should get significantly higher like 22 seconds of extra remain in battle is just not that big of a deal if that's the only thing it's doing so i think that's actually the most disappointing spell in that one's law of magic okay fire uh fire was an s tier law of magic in warhammer 2 and it is an s tier law of magic in warhammer 3 because it basically remains unchanged. So going over that one, the Law of Fire. This spell, Cascading Fire Clock, only affects one unit. Not that big of a deal. Fireball, you know, damage dealing spell. Decent damage, it's okay. Um, not very good armor piercing. Uh, Flaming Sword of Ruin is better in Warhammer 3 than it was in 2. Because magical attacks are more valuable now than they used to be. Burning Head seems to be crap compared to Warhammer 2. But that's not that big of a deal. Because Piercing Bolts of Burning... And Flamestorm are so powerful. Um, this one here has always been the go-to flame spell, uh, the, the go-to vortex on the game. Um, you can get that cost down to 10 Winds of Magic. It lasts ages and dishes out so much damage. This is probably the best vortex spell in the game in terms of bang for buck. And that's really why this one here gets the S tier because of Flamestorm. It just deletes infantry units. And this one here is surprisingly good against single entities as well. But yeah, you've got a lot of utility here with... Um, uh, fire magic for damage dealing and damage dealing I think is the most valuable type of magic in uh, Total War Warhammer Then you've got the law of heavens law of heavens. I think is a good law of magic. I'm gonna put it under eight here Okay, law of heavens going over that harmonic convergence only affects one unit wind blast Decent wind spell doesn't do any armor piercing. It's, it's okay. Uranon's Thunderbolt really good a lot better than it used to be in Warhammer 2 I think the if you overcast this on a blob explodes it really bloody powerful curse of the midnight wind is a really good debuff because it's area of effect without requiring overcasting uh comet of cassandora while it's not 100 percent accurate at wherever you select it on you've got to be careful of that you might hit your own units um make sure the unit is pinned down before you, you cast this but it is a really good bombardment spell uh, and chain lightning is a cheap um vortex spell does a lot of damage you just got to be careful because it moves around a fair bit so be careful around your own um, infantry with this one. But overall, just a really solid lore of magic there. So we're going to put that one, yeah, put that in A tier. Now, death magic. In Warhammer 2, I probably would have ranked that, oh, I can't remember what I did, but I didn't rank it very highly. I don't like the spells in the lore of death, but I like the passive. Uh, the passive for lore of death is better in Warhammer 3 than it is in 2. So, I'm actually going to put this as B tier, because I feel like it's exactly where it should be, and there's some there's some things that you could do with death magic, right? So, we go over it. Um, the passive, which I don't think we can see it here, but what, what the passive does is restore some of your winds of magic, right? About 2.5 winds of magic you get back. So, because you've got some really cheap spells here, like Aspect of the Dread Knight, if you cast this spell, you can essentially get that spell for free, as long as you cast it once every 25 seconds. So, that can be quite powerful. Uh, Spirit Leech is better in Warhammer 3, because essentially it's cheaper. You get that Winds of Magic cost down to 6, and then the passive, you get it down to like 3.5, so it's cheaper than it was before. 
Uh, Doom and Darkness, really good uh, terror-based spell, like reducing leadership. Again, every every single spell on this Law of Magic is essentially cheaper than it was in Warhammer 2 because of the passive. Soul Blight is okay, debuff spell. Veda Bajuna is really expensive. I hate this spell. Very dam uh, good amount of damage, but it's just ridiculously expensive for a direct damage dealing spell. And the Purple Son of Xerius, while it does do a lot of damage, it's just, it's nowhere near as powerful as, like, the Law of Fire one. Yeah, it does less damage, it costs more Winds of Magic, and it doesn't last as long. So, a bit of a weird thing how they sort of balance that, like... Maybe it's because it does more armor piercing, that's what it is. But yeah, I've cast this on big blobs before, and it just didn't really do that much. I don't know what it is about it. Maybe just the the area of effect of it isn't quite as big as the Laura Fire one. Also, it just doesn't last as long. But overall, most of these spells are pretty mediocre. And the thing that stopped this one here from getting into C tier, it was never getting into D tier, it was the passive. The passive is a lot better for them in Warhammer uh, 3. Okay, then we've got High Magic. Alright, let's go over the spells for High Magic. So, this is a lore of magic that I've had a bit of a mixed relationship with over, over the years. Um, they've got some really lame spells and some really powerful spells. So, Hand of Glory, I think, is really lame because it only affects one unit. Uh, Apotheosis is a good heal spell for sure. Soul Quench is okay. Um, and it's got this direct damage thing over here. That'll, so it's got two different types of damage, kind of like um, uh, Dwellers Below. It's it's alright. Tempest is eh. It's, it only affects flying units. It slows them down a fair bit. It can be a bit finicky because... <coughs> excuse me. You can't cast it on the ground, right? So you can't sort of predict... If something is moving towards you, you can't predict where it's going to be to cast it in front of them. You have to select the actual unit. And oftentimes it'll cast on an area when the unit has already moved through it, so you don't, just don't get that much out of it. So I think that in terms of how this spell has been implemented into the game, it's actually quite bad. And that if you could just cast it on the ground, it would make a, a, a much... it would be a much better spell. Because like, in, in theory it's good, but in practice it can really let you down. Fiery Convocation is essentially a Wind of Death, very powerful spell. Doesn't quite do as much damage as Wind of Death, but it has a much longer range, which you're not going to get that full range out of it anyway, because it's kind of ridiculously long, but it is very powerful, and it is a bit expensive. And then you've got Arcane Unforging here, which is a direct damage spell, which increases cooldown. It's a bit expensive. It's not that good in my opinion. So overall, I think that the Lore of High Magic, the best spell is actually Apotheosis and Fiery Convocation, and the, um, the passive is alright as well. Uh, the Shield of Safari, which provides a ward save um, for your army map-wide. But overall, I think that the uh, lore of High Magic, because we've got to talk about this in terms of context, is actually C tier, because there are only two races in the game that get it. The High Elves and the Wood Elves. And both of those factions get access to the Lore of Life, to the Lore of Fire. Oh, and sorry, the Wood Elves don't get access to the Lore of Fire. So, High Elves get access to... So, both of them get access to the Lore of Life. High Elves get access to Lore of Fire. Um, the High Elves get access to, to the all main eight uh, Winds of Magic, and they're all ranked higher than it. Uh, and the Wood Elves get access to... Um, so was it? Fire... No, sorry. Life, Shadow, and Beast Magic. And, and now Dark Magic as well. So in terms of context, there's just not really that much point to recruit this over other ones. It's just not competitive on the campaign map compared to the other ones, and that's why it's entering C tier. It's actually not a bad Lore of Magic. It would enter B tier. It's just that the factions that can recruit it have better options. That's all it comes down to. It's the same reason why these ones are down here. The factions that can recruit it have way better options than it. And then we've got the Lore of Dark Magic. Now, this one here in Warhammer 2, I wasn't too fond of, but I think it's actually pretty good in Warhammer 3. So, Power of Darkness is really good for Winds of Magic Power Reserves, which is a bit of a problem in Warhammer 3. So, using this one here, you can get a decent amount of, of reserves back. So, having multiple spell cuts, spells uh, casters of Dark Magic in an army, you can generate a bit of wins. It does damage your own units a little bit, but that's okay. <laughs> that's what they're there for, really. Um, but yeah, good amount of power. Chill Wind is quite powerful. 
Um, does a good amount of damage. It's all armor piercing. I feel like it's better than it was in Warhammer 2. Word of Pain is not great. It's, it's okay. It only affects one unit. Blade Wind is very damaging. Uh, not so much armor piercing, but it is cheap. It's a, it's a decent um, Vortex spell. Doom Bolt is it's okay. Good bombardment that the AI can't really dodge. And Soul Stealer is pretty decent. It's a bit of a weird thing where you can cast this one on the ground and still get the heals. So you don't have to actually be stealing any souls so it's a bit of a weird one that one but it is uh, quite valuable to heal your spellcaster but it really comes down to power of darkness being able to generate you loads of winds of magic because what you can do is use power of darkness to generate winds of magic i know it costs winds of magic to cast it but you get you you more than get it back you cast this one here and then you use other laws of magic to like better spells because the dark elves they've got access to law of fire i guess context is important with this one as well isn't it so let's talk about that um, the two, hang on, let me stop that one there. There are two factions that get access to dark magic, dark elves and wood elves. So the dark elves have access to fire magic, to death magic, shadow magic, right? I think they've got beasts as well, I actually can't remember. Yeah, yeah, they've got beast magic. And the wood elves, we've already gone over which laws of magic they have. So, I feel like Dark Magic would have entered C tier if it wasn't for Power of Darkness. So, it actually ends up being better than High Magic now. And that's my Law of Magic tier list there. So, it really comes down to, like, these these ones here that entered S tier are, like, the must-go-to for those factions that get access to them. And the ones that enter down here, they're just... They're outclassed by other laws of magic. It's not that these laws of magic can't do anything. They absolutely can. Every single law of magic, if used correctly, um, can you know, sway the course of the battle for you. It's just that other laws of magic are either easier to use, cheaper to use, have way more potency, way more utility, and some of these just have just very low impact. But anyway, that's my tier list there. Let me know in the comments below what you think of my selection, whether you think the explanations were sound based on based on the context of how you should recruit these based on campaign. Yeah, appreciate you guys. Don't forget to check out Instant Gaming, and we'll see you next time. Later, guys.